This episode of Lost Highways is being released by History Colorado as many of us are staying home in an effort to keep our communities safe during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. To those of you out there who are unable to stay home, whether it's because you're working to keep people safe, provide health care, or provide supplies, thank you. Lost Highways from History Colorado is made possible by the Sturm Family Foundation, proud supporters of the humanities and the power of storytelling for more than 20 years. And by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, exploring the human endeavor. In 1979, curator and historian Peggy Ford Waldo had just started working at the Greeley History Museum when she stumbled upon a mysterious artifact buried away in storage. And um, hanging in our very tiny collection storage area was a dress made of the skins of rattlesnakes, and it was just protected with a dry cleaner's bag. A dress made of rattlesnake skins. Naturally, Ford Waldo, who you might remember from some of our previous episodes about Deerfield and Native American mascots, was curious. It looks like a flapper dress, and of course, uh, a dress made of snake skins with the, um, the hem of the dress being all the rattles of these skins intact, would have been in for um, a great time of, you know, let's shake, rattle, and roll. And it wasn't just a dress. Along with it was an entire flapper outfit made of snakeskins and rattles, including accessories. There was a pair of shoes that had been covered with rattlesnake skins, and there was a headband with very large rattles glued all the way around it, and then there was a necklace made of, again, very large rattles. So curiosity is whetted when you encounter something like this because, obviously, it's quite unusual. The dress and its creator would become one of the Greeley History Museum's most prized artifacts, and decades later it would be discovered by a musician from one of Colorado's best-known bands. My name is Neela Pekarik, and I'm from Denver, Colorado. I guess uh, most folks might be most familiar with my time with a band called the Lumineers. I've been trying to do it right. Even if you don't know the Lumineers by name, you've probably heard their music. Um, I spent the better part of a decade with that band and then left a couple of years ago to pursue my own music. So I went to school up in Greeley, Colorado, at the University of Northern Colorado, and a lot of times uh, we would just kind of explore the town. Um, Greeley's not a huge town with not a, a ton to do, especially as college students. And we found ourselves in the in the historical museum one day, uh, which wasn't super out of the ordinary for us. Um, and so we were really interested in all of that. <laughs> and Rattlesnake Kate is sort of the main event at the Greeley History Museum. The real story of Rattlesnake Kate isn't actually about the dress. It's about how she ended up with enough snakeskins to make it. Neela found it strange that this iconic Western woman is somehow still reduced to the things she wore. The one thing that's kind of left behind in this embodiment that's been preserved is her dress. And um, that's in the Greeley Museum. And it's it's really stunning. And it's just an outrageous thing to see close up. You know, you can see the hand stitching and the fact that she went back to this like traumatic place to this, you know, place of so much scary trauma to gather the skins of these snakes to make a dress is just insane to me. The iconic rattlesnake skin outfit is more than just an outfit. Peggy Ford Waldo has done tons of research on the life of the woman who made it, Kate Slaughterback. And Neela Pekarik has made her the focus of not only her first solo album, but an entire musical theater production as well. You'll hear songs from the album throughout the episode, and the musical is set to premiere in February 2021 in Denver. I also am from Colorado, and I had never heard this story before, and that was kind of striking to me as well. 
the more I learned about her, it just was full of this rich storytelling. Just this sort of feeling of, of not having a voice all the time. And she was a person that really fought to be exactly who she was, um, even if it rubbed people the wrong way sometimes. And um, I, I often feel like I live in a world where I have to be a people pleaser to really to be successful, and it doesn't always feel great. Um, and so as I, as I sort of thought about her a lot, started writing about her a lot and reading about her a lot, um, the more I found my own voice and the more I kind of had the courage to, to believe that I could do something different um, and put my own record out. The dress, in many ways, is a symbol of that courage. It was a courage exhibited by many of the women who lived in the American West at the time. And you don't hear much about those women in books, movies, or TV shows. But Kate was different. Rattlesnake Kate Slaughterback's life was larger than life. She couldn't be ignored. From History Colorado, this is Lost Highways, dispatches from the shadows of the Rocky Mountains. I'm Tyler Hill. And I'm Noel Black. On each episode, Tyler and I explore overlooked stories from our home state of Colorado and the American West. On this episode, Rattlesnake Kate Slaughterback, an archetypal pioneer woman with a mythical, extraordinary life, an entrepreneurial spirit, and a tall tale to tell. To understand how Kate Slaughterback ended up making that snakeskin dress, it helps to know where she came from. So, you know, Rattlesnake Kate, she was born in 1893. She was born in a small log cabin that was located about nine miles east of Longmont, Colorado. Her mother died when Kate was quite young. She died in in 1896. And this left Kate growing up with her father, her two brothers. So here is um, this little girl being around and being influenced by a lot of men very early on in her life. Lindsay McNatt has been an elementary school teacher in Denver Public Schools for 16 years. She wrote a children's book about Kate Slaughterback for the DPS curriculum. I didn't necessarily find facts about it, but I kind of imagined that he, you know, let her kind of come into her own and didn't hold her in that typical female role that we would have expected as far as, you know, taking care of the family and and cleaning and cooking and that kind of a thing. Um, And she was just able to you know, become an awesome marksman with her rifle and and be able to know all of these things about taking care of herself and living and running a homestead on her own. And um, to say that she was most likely a tomboy is very accurate. She loved to be outside. She loved animals. She herself mentions this um, many times in her conversations with other people, and in her correspondence with a man from Iowa named Buckskin Bill. A lot of what we know about Kate Slaughterback comes from their correspondence. And in these letters, Kate writes quite a bit about herself. And of course, many things that she writes are true. A few things that she writes are, um, I would say, not so true. She had Uh, Rumor has it, six failed marriages. Um, You know, she wasn't very close with her family members. Her mother died when she was quite young. Um, She was raised by her father and her brothers. Um, So just really rough and tumble, I think, uh, from the the get-go. But also very resourceful. I mean, she ran her own farm. She built her own farmhouse. And every time she talks about hiring help, you know, nobody can do any of the jobs right. (laughs) And if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself kind of attitude. Kate describes to her pen pal, Buckskin Bill, she says that uh, she's 36 years old. She says she's 5 feet 4 inches tall. She wears a size three and a half shoe. She says, I have great big strong hands and I weigh 110 pounds. She says she's Irish and she has a temper. She has gray blue eyes, the color of George Washington's. She occasionally smokes. She drinks occasionally, but she does not go on any benders. Again, when it comes to the life of rattlesnake Kate Slaughterback, it's somewhat hard to discern fact from fiction. But she told Buckskin Bill that she left home at a young age. She said that she ran away. She stole some food. She stole some clothes from her brother. She disguised herself as a boy. And she walked the railroad tracks 
all the way to uh, Red Cloud, Nebraska. Uh, She was hiding along the way, sleeping under bridge trestles, catching minnows in the little streams and eating them raw, drinking creek water, washing herself in the the little creeks and streams. Neela Pekarik says that she felt a strong connection with Kate Slaughterback and drew parallels between Kate's life and her own on her album Rattlesnake. I mean, Train Song, that's, that starts the record, you know, a lot of folks, I put that out as my first single, and they said, like, this sounds like, you know, sort of your <laughs> departure from the Lumineers, and that's totally accurate. And so I just sort of saw it as, like, embarking on, an, on you know, new things for her life, um, and that's a lot of the sort of Western dream, you know, all these, all these folks moved West with these hopes of really amazing opportunities and a better life for themselves. Kate lived a few different places throughout the West before ultimately ending up back in Colorado. While living in Colorado, Kate Slaughterback allegedly became a registered nurse, among other things. Between 1914 and 1918, that's the war years, Kate states that she was a Red Cross nurse at Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver. Well, research into the records does not show that she really became a registered nurse. So more than likely, she had some training perhaps as maybe a licensed practical nurse at either St. Joseph's Hospital or perhaps at a hospital uh, in Longmont. She also becomes interested in taxidermy, and she takes correspondence courses And she becomes quite proficient at this skill. And she adopted a kid, Ernie. But Peggy Ford Waldo thinks there's more to Ernie's story. So, looking through some archival photographs of Kate, there is one showing her in Casper in 1921, in which she appears to be quite pregnant. So, the story probably... um, got configured in some way to save face. It's complicated, and nobody really knows the truth. So, at any rate, um, lots of little interesting twists and turns related to this. In 1923, Kate homesteaded on 640 acres in the Hudson area. Actually, uh, she was able to purchase several parcels of land. She said that her father had left her $12,000 when he passed away. He would have died in 1918. And she would tell Ernie, um, her son, she'd say, you know, we earn our bread by the sweat of our brow. And she was a dirt farmer, so she didn't pay people to work the land. Um, She did it all herself. So she would raise crops that she would mainly feed to her animals um, and then sell the milk and that kind of stuff. And she had, you know, cows and turkeys and chickens and pigs and that kind of stuff. Lindsay McNatt says that Kate was nothing if not strong-willed. She continued to use a harvester um, even after it became illegal. So it was a a two-person harvester where one person was supposed to drive the mule and then one person was supposed to sit on the harvester. But the blades would cut and if somebody got in front of it it could actually like cut their legs off so enough people got hurt that they um, made them illegal but she was just like nope I'm going to use it anyway because it works really well. She also um, really I think feels that she is living in the wrong era. She would have liked to have lived in the 19th century. She read lots of dime novels about the American West. She loves uh, horses. She loves the history of the American West. I remember growing up that I I was fascinated with Laura Ingalls Wilder and that kind of thing. And in essence, it almost does end up being a survival story, like being able to hunt for your own food and take care of yourself when you're sick and all of those kinds of things. So I think we're drawn to that strength and independence and, and just that idea of overcoming these obstacles that kind of come up.
And of course, um, in the 1920s, the next big thing that happens that really brought a lot of fame to Kate was this incident in which she um, comes across a lot of uh, snakes that are um, migrating across a, a field. Um, this was October 28th of 1925. She and Ernie started out on horseback towards a lake where a few wounded ducks were left by hunters the day before. She had put the saddle on her horse, Brownie. She put Ernie in the you know, back of the saddle, and she brought along her 22 Remington rifle. What happened next would earn Kate Slaughter back the nickname Rattlesnake Kate and change her life forever. As the number of cases of COVID-19 grows in Colorado, History Colorado wants to hear from you about how the outbreak is changing your daily life. Tell us about what you're doing to navigate work and family needs. Has your place of work reduced hours or been forced to close? What steps have you and your family taken to prevent the virus's spread? What will you remember about this moment? Help History Colorado document this important history in the making. We've set up multiple ways for you to share your stories, photographs, and videos with us. You can call us at 720-466-8215 to record your story. Or you can email a voice memo, photo, or video to curator at state.co.us. You can get more information about how to participate at www.historycolorado.org slash COVID-19 or in the episode description for this episode. Thanks for doing your part to care for our community. Here are Peggy Ford Waldo, Lindsay McNatt, and Neela Pekarik describing the terrifying episode that turned Kate Slaughter back into Rattlesnake Kate. So, this is the story. Before she could get to the lakes, she had to dismount from her horse and open a barbed wire gate and lead her horse through. And as she was approaching the gate, she saw a rattlesnake come out. So she had her rifle, she shot it. But when that sound of her gun went, then three more snakes came out. Then she shot another one. And another one. And another one. She actually described it as the sound like wind blowing through dry leaves. And it was just like the sound of all the rattles and the snakes starting to move. And she knew that she couldn't kill them all with her rifle, load and reload. And she looked for a stick or something to kill them. And she was just terrified that Brownie, the horse, was going to get spooked and throw Ernie and then they would both be in danger. So she um, kind of ironically grabbed a no hunting sign that was there and started using it as a club and beating the snakes as they were coming towards her. She used it as a club for the next two hours as she uh, was just kind of battling the snakes as they were coiled up. She hit them in the head, uh, uh, dashed their heads into the ground. And um, what we think is that she had stumbled into uh, like a den of of migrating snakes that were headed to to go to wherever they were going to winter. And big groups of those can sometimes have several hundred snakes in them. She talks about, you know, these these snakes were springing at her and it all just feels a little bit um, animated. Hitting snake after snake and if they would kind of like jump at her, she would actually use the sign like a baseball bat and kind of hit them away from her. And so finally, when all the rattling stopped after about two hours, uh, Kate was then able to go back home. Her hands were just like covered with blisters and she had like a red swollen face just from, you know, all the exertion being outside for that long and and fighting off the snakes for so long. And then they went uh, out with some tubs and collected the snakes. And so they counted that she had killed 140 snakes and the neighbor went and told one of the newspapers down in Denver. 
Neil and Pekarik thinks it's fair to say that the way Kate described the story is maybe a little exaggerated. You know, and I wonder about that, that, you know, if if provoked, sure, I'm, I would imagine a rattlesnake would would defend itself. But um, the idea that these snakes were attacking her, I think, is pretty far fetched. Thinking about two hours, you know, that she's kind of slaughtering these snakes. I'm just picturing her, you know, towards the end of that, just being exhausted. And she's kind of almost still looking like, are the are there any more alive? Let me make sure they're all dead. Um, and it's just kind of an interesting thing to me. Um, and I mean, she was a woman that had a lot to be mad about. Rattlesnake Kate, known Kate Slaughter back Got a nickname when she was looking for ducks and then a rattlesnake attack She saw just one snake, then two, then ten Pulled out a twenty-two rifle and the massacre began Before too long she had no bullets left Grabbed a sign right out of the ground and clobbered them to death She was on horseback with her son, and she said, you know, for two hours, she was, like, fighting off these snakes. Um, And I thought a lot about, you know, if that was actually necessary. Like, at some point, did she have the means to get through? But maybe she had just, like, so much rage inside of her um, that she kept fighting. And um, it's something we've, we've thought a lot about as we've started to write this musical about her. And the idea of, you know, women with rage and women with anger. Um, It's just been really interesting kind of through that perspective. You know, through the marriages she had, she had a a lot of really bad marriages. Um, She talks about one husband that ran off with Um, I think it was $5,000, which by today's standards is probably like $75,000. I think she was just a really tough lady. Um, And so it really got me thinking about that rage. Um, And, you know, even now I think it's it's kind of an odd an odd thing for for women to express anger and rage. Pekarik says that's a rage that she's familiar with herself. You know, I was I was in a, a band with with all men and we you know, the majority of the people that worked for us were men. And so often I would watch, like, my male counterparts express anger or rage or frustration, and they were taken super seriously, and I just didn't always feel like I received that back. I actually had one conversation where we had just an outrageous tour ahead of us, and we were trying to decide if we were going to, you know, cut off, you know, cancel a few dates or something, and um, the manager said to me, oh, well, if you do this tour, think about all those pretty dresses you can buy. Carrick channeled that rage, both her own and the anger that she feels Rattlesnake Kate must have felt, on her album. There's a song on the record that's called Miffed, and I think miffed is such a funny word for anger um, because it's so just sort of cute. (laughs) And uh, in one of the letters she was talking about, um, she had been sprayed by a skunk, and she described her feelings about it as being really miffed. And I just sort of thought about, you know, all these things that I had been thinking about in terms of her anger and, and rage. And miffed was such a funny sort of way to to soften that. I wanna scream. I wanna shout. You make me feel poison from the inside out. I can't eat. I can't think of sleep. Thank you. 
yeah, it's you know it does have a lot of rage in it, um, and there's a refrain in it. You know, can anyone hear me? Um, and I often felt that way. Like, didn't if I if I got mad, um, I often feel like I'm throwing like a temper tantrum. Um, whereas again, I'd, I'd watch my male counterparts um, ask for exactly what they needed and and raise their voice and get mad and be taken totally seriously. Um, and so. Yeah, I just, it was something I, I thought a lot about in terms of rage and, and anger. Lindsay McNatt. So she did, then took some of the snakes that she had killed and she made kind of her famous dress. So she um, took four of the biggest snakes that she could find their skins and made a bodice of a dress. And then she used 43 snake skins to make the skirt. And she kind of styled it after like a flapper dress. Um, and she would wear it to special parties and, and she was very protective of it. And, you know, the story had gotten around so people wanted to see the dress that she had made and hear her story and she made a belt that matched the dress and a bracelet and shoes um, and then so she would wear this whole outfit. There's a song on the record that's called The Perfect Gown. There was something interesting about this woman who was kind of summed up after, you know, running her own farm, going through all these hardships in, in terms of her marriage and divorces and, uh, you know, the, the rattlesnake encounter, all these things, is also summed up by what she wore. Um, and I certainly felt that way. Uh, so often, you know, in an interview or something, my bandmates would be asked, like, when did you start playing the guitar? When did you start writing songs? How did you get so good at this <laughs> craft? And if I got asked a question so often, it would be like, how do you choose your outfits for the shows? But I worked so hard to learn how to play the cello and how to sing and how to write songs. Um, and it always felt really overshadowed by that. Um, and again, just not being taken very seriously, I think is a big theme on the record in general. The perfect gown Does it flatter The perfect gown Does it make you matter The perfect gown Will it make them take you seriously the perfect gown Will it be your mark on history? But I'll hide, yes I'll hide I've got everyone free And I'll smile Cause that's what we do Not feeling hurt all the time, uh, smiling, <laughs> that's what we're supposed to do, um, and just kind of being summed up no matter how hard we work and how hard we try, uh, just often you know, being held back by kind of physical appearances. Soon after the attack, Slaughterback began to realize just how remarkable her experience had been. Here's Peggy Ford Waldo. Again, she was thinking this was quite an, an adventure. So she contacted some people from the Fort Lupton newspaper. Reporters came out and she strung all of these snakes that she had killed 
onto a piece of wire, and she had her photo taken. So this was a documented event that happened and that was reported on in the papers. And knowing how difficult it was just to survive in rural Colorado at the time, she used the publicity to her advantage. Times were hard. Kate was resourceful. And so she was then able to make a little cottage industry out of selling the tanned rattlesnake skins. They could be made into belts. They could be made into hat bands. With her taxidermy skills, she could mount the rattlesnakes in a coiled position and use them as the base of lamps or use them as ashtrays. She even started catching rattlesnakes, milking them for their venom, and selling it to researchers. At one point, she got tired of the snake business, feeding them and doing this. And so one day, instead of um, milking the snakes for the venom, she just got out a shovel. She took the tongs. She put each snake on the ground, chopped off its head, put the heads in a box with a note that said, here, extract the venom yourself. I quit and mailed it off to California. She said she really hated rattlesnakes, but it kind of became this, like, burden to bear um, because it really, it, 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 she was able to monetize it. And I think you kind of had to in those days, um, you know, living out in, in the rural, rural Colorado where nothing grows in the winter, of course, and barely grows in the summertime. You know, just kind of anything. I think she, she really was that kind of entrepreneurial mind, um, you know, either by necessity or I, I don't think she really had a choice. It was, you know, either you make this money and you're able to, to survive another winter or you don't. And the more the story was told, the more mythical it became. So it's always going back to the source to find the truth of this woman. And I think probably we won't always know the truth. Neela Pekarik says she relates to the feeling of suddenly finding fame when she hadn't planned on it. I had had, you know, a really strange ride uh, <laughs> in the in the years that I'd been with the Lumineers. Um, you know, just a huge shift of identity and in terms of like I was living, you know, um, kind of apartment to apartment, crashing with friends. I had tons of student loan debt, no idea what I was going to do. And, um, you know, around this was around like 2010. And by 2012... We were nominated for Grammys. We were traveling to Europe. We, you know, we got to play at the White House for President Obama. Um, we opened for U2, like all this crazy stuff um, in a short ma- amount of time. And and Kate experienced a little bit of that, I think, in her in her rattlesnake encounter because she was written about in all kinds of papers all over the world. And she had a really interesting relationship to that bit of fame that she experienced where I think she wanted people to understand, you know, this thing that she did. Um, but she also loved her privacy. And I think, um, you know, she kind of spent the rest of her life trying to capitalize on that one afternoon. Rattlesnake Kate's legend continued to grow. And even beyond the rattlesnake incident, her life often seemed unbelievable. Here's Lindsay McNatt. You know, she had just so so many crazy experiences that happened to her. So she was struck by lightning when she was out working on the farm one time. Um, and uh, Ernie was still pretty young when that happened. And she was just she reached for uh, her gate. And when the lightning struck the gate, it went into her and she was unconscious for several hours, I guess. Um, and Ernie was freaking out, but uh, she was OK and, and recovered all right. But some of Kate's stories were less exciting than that. Stories about the kinds of hardships you'd expect for a person living on their own in the West at the time. Her mailbox was three and a half miles from her house, and so she'd have to kind of travel far to to get supplies or to to get that and everything. So on one of her trips that she was doing, she fell off of her horse and got kicked, and she broke her arm and her collarbone. Yeah, and Brownie is the perfect uh, sort of example of the world's colliding of Rattlesnake Kate. Um, So she had a horse named Brownie. Um, and I, in those letters, she writes like most affectionately for Brownie. Like the way she talks about Brownie, she doesn't talk about her son that way. She doesn't talk about family members that way. But you can just sort of hear her voice melting a little bit every time she talks about that horse because she loved that horse and they were kind of, you know, best pals. And a lot of people feel that way, um, you know, even with their dogs and stuff, but especially with horses, you know, people really have that connection. Um, and, you know, also just the survival part of, of what, what a horse meant to, you know, uh, a person of the West, um, and, you know, traditionally to a cowboy, but in this case to, to, to Rattlesnake Kate. 
Again, Pekarik found the story plenty relatable to her life in the 21st century. Brownie, I had to write a song about Brownie, I knew, because I just thought she's such an important part of this story. Um, and Kate was so alone in so many ways, but then she had this horse that she kind of, you know, talked to and talked about. Um, and so I had had a pretty sad friendship breakup uh, with a friend and it was really traumatic almost more probably more so than a lot of my failed romantic relationships um, because we were just so close and we just kind of grew apart Um, but I wrote this song kind of as as a friendship breakup song and and just this idea of like you know you're the person or in this case a horse that you put all your faith in is you know you're the one that's most loyal to me and then you get kicked (laughs) in the clavicle. All of these experiences created a romanticized Western mythos around Rattlesnake Kate that has appealed to people across the country, both at the time and in the modern day. Peggy Ford Waldo says that years after the initial attack, in 1932, that mythos made its way into the hands of a man named Floyd Gibbons. Gibbons ran an adventure magazine called the Elgin Adventurers Club. And so he asked her to send photographs of herself wearing the dress and other photographs of her at her farm because he thought people would be interested. So again, a few years from seven or so years from when this story first happened by the 1930s, uh, people were interested uh, in it again. At some point, that story made its way to Colonel Charles D. Randolph, who had given himself the nickname Buckskin Bill, the self-proclaimed Poet of the Plains. Floyd Gibbons is uh, promoting her story through newspapers. So he was um, a big reader of dime novels and wrote a lot of, you know, dime novels and poetry, that sort of thing. So a story like Rattlesnake Cates would have definitely, um, you know, intrigued him. Buckskin Bill was fascinated by the West, and he loved these old Western stories, and he would write these stories about Kate and Buckskin Bill on these adventures together. There's this outrageous one where he writes about how they had to, like, fight these pumas out in the West and, like, um, just these outrageous stories. I don't think that he was a person that actually went on those adventures, um, but I think he was really fascinated by them, as, as people still are. I mean, we're still fascinated by the Wild West. Buckskin Bill's fascination with Rattlesnake Kate sparked a written correspondence between the two Western icons that would span nearly 40 years. Though they never actually met in person, Bill became one of Kate's closest friends and confidants. Support for History Colorado comes from Colorado State University. CSU embraces the critical role that History Colorado plays in preserving and telling the stories of our state and the West. As Colorado's land-grant university, CSU is proud to be a partner in programming and outreach statewide. As they celebrate 150 years of education, research, and service, CSU remains committed to preserving the past and creating a brighter future. Learn more at colostate.edu. Buckskin Bill, also married and divorced five or six times, reached out to Rattlesnake Kate after being captivated by her story. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of what we know about the inner life of Rattlesnake Kate comes from their letters. He became kind of fascinated by her and started writing to her, um, and they just exchanged letters over and over, and they never met, which was really fascinating to me. Um, Because the letters are just full of a lot of um, kind of intimate details about both of their lives that it's interesting to tell a stranger. Um, 
but I think she found this outlet of someone that kind of made her feel seen and heard and understood in a way that she didn't always feel, I think, in her real life. Um, and so the more I read through those letters, and especially reading from her voice and her perspective, um, the more I kind of felt that. And I just, I couldn't stop reading them, and I read them over and over. Um, and I, you know, I can't pinpoint the moment, but it was certainly during reading that letter exchange that I thought, this is more than just one song, this is more than an album, I think this is like a whole thing. Um, and I think people should know about her, and um, I also just, yeah, I thought if I felt understood and seen by by reading about this person, I imagine there's other people that'll feel that way too. The correspondence dates from 1931 to 1943, and then again from 1965 to 1968. So there may have been letters from 1944 to 64, but um, who knows? Were those destroyed or were just other things happening in both their lives? where they just didn't write to each other. He was a writer and he was a poet, and so I think this idea of her was really fascinating. Um, But, you know, at some point he gets married and he says to her, like, I've got a wife now, but um, you should keep writing me letters, just send them to this P.O. box so that my wife doesn't find out. And instead, Kate says, like, oh, well, no, I'll just write to you and your wife. And, you know, I I sort of felt like, oh, I would be so devastated, and I I don't... can't really tell how she felt about it but either way she keeps writing and I think again just the it didn't matter to her that he was married as much as it mattered to her to keep having this confidant um to write to but even after she had died he was he lived longer than she did and um he tried to get in touch to to write you know a book about her and he had sort of fabricated a lot of stories that they had met and that they had kind of romped around the west together when when she was a teenager and like that definitely never happened. <laughs> well, I think they they both would have understood each other very, very well. But she just didn't seem to get along all that well with being married and having a man as the head of her household. She was the head of her household. She was the mover and shaker in her own life, and she never wanted anybody to tell her what to do or not to do. The correspondence was convenient for both of them. They could feel a connection with each other and keep each other company without the pressure of an in-person relationship. And so as I read through those letters, I just, you know, it was interesting to me to to see her kind of pouring her heart out to this stranger. And she, you know, asks him over and over to come visit. And I, I wonder how much of that, like if he had actually done it, um, how she would have felt about it and if, you know, that may have ruined the correspondence is sort of the mystery um, that kept some of that alive. You know, they didn't have an actual relationship and he didn't actually have to spend time with her. That was really attractive. Um, and I think, you know, he, he sort of glamorized a lot of those qualities in her of being strong and being brave um, in a way that, you know, wasn't always great on its feet in person, but really fun to think about in sort of an arm's length way. In that way, I do think she felt pretty understood by him. Like, oh, if you were, if you were my sweetheart, like things would be great because you understand that, like I'm, I'm crazy and I'm, you know, uh, she sort of is self-deprecating in a lot of the the letters. You know, oh, I've I've been out in the sun and I, my my skin's all weathered, so I'm not going to send you a photo until the the winter comes again, because I don't want you to see me like this. And he kind of writes back, like, oh, I don't care about that stuff, and you know. But at the end of the day, she invites him over and over to come visit her and he never turns up. Saw you in the paper, you're too good to be true. Had to write a letter, how I'd love to get to know you. Forgive me if I'm forward, but you're perfect, it's true. Give your secrets to 
to the mailman, send them on through. Dearest buckskin bill, you flatter me just so. I'm afraid you won't want me, you're weather beaten and old. How much, my dear, would you love me if I let you? Don't need a crystal ball to know you, my son. But yeah, I mean, in terms of of him kind of understanding her, you know, just the fact that he wrote back every time um, and they kept writing back and forth um, for that long period of time. It's just kind of interesting um, that, you know, it it feels less personal, maybe, um, that it was him and more that someone was was interested in what she had to say, even if it was just like recounting what she did that day, you know. These are the things I did on my farm, and these are the chores I did today, and I'm gonna do this tomorrow. And it's a lot of the letters are kind of mundane, but it made me made me think, you know, she didn't have a lot of other people to talk to. Peggy Ford Waldo says that rattlesnake Kate purposefully lived a 19th century lifestyle out on the plains. Her Luddite tendencies made those letters all the more meaningful. A lot of people were beginning to embrace radio and um, FDR's fireside talks during the 1930s and during the Depression era, but not Kate. So what would come into her home that would... um, bring her communication and joy from the outside world. It would be, you know, this correspondence from her friend Buckskin Bill. As many of Rattlesnake Kate's letters to Buckskin Bill indicate, a lot of her days were mundane. She did many of the same things most people trying to survive in the West did at the time. Here's Lindsay McNatt. She, you know, would get up early and work 10 to 12 hours working outside, you know, working on the crops, taking care of the animals, um, having to kind of combat some of the different things that weather and that kind of stuff would would offer challenges. I I think a lot about, you know, she lived uh, to be 71 and talks a lot about, you know, her neighbors dying of the flu or a cold or in childbirth. Um, She helped deliver a lot of babies amongst the women in her sort of rural area. And um, she just, you know, kind of died. Uh, She she did get sick uh, and went to the hospital and um, and died at around 71, which was a pretty long life for the time. Um, and that, you know, nothing else got her first. I mean, she was struck by lightning, all these things that, that she just, she couldn't really be crushed. You know, I think she was, she had this spirit about her that, um, really carried her a lot longer in life than some of the folks, uh, in that, you know, in those really treacherous circumstances. As a teacher, we kind of see how, kids and and people in general are are always looking for themselves in in stories and in pictures and that kind of stuff and we we connect to those stories through um how we relate and how we see that we're similar and different uh to the people that we learn about and and the history that we learn about as well and so bringing those stories to life so that so that that girls as well can find that connection and kind of have somebody that they could look up to or strive to be like is is so important. One of the tasks I have for our musical, um, every musical has what's called the I Want song, and it kind of informs us. It usually comes like three or four songs in, and it kind of informs us why we're going to sit in a theater for two and a half hours and watch this story. Um, so like it's like a part of your world in Little Mermaid or My Shot in Hamilton or, um, I don't know, every sort of Disney movie or musical has one. And so I was tasked with writing our Rattlesnake Kate I Want song. And I ended up calling it I Want Everything. And it's kind of this idea of, of being the kind of woman that is, you know, an entrepreneur or does have all these ideas and leadership and speaks her mind, but being, um, you know, but still being lovable and worthy of love. All I want is to meet my match You'll love me cause I'm funny 
You love me cause I'm free And I laugh the loudest at your jokes I'll be the cleverest in hopes One thing I do like about her is that she didn't put on any kind of varnish or any kind of airs or any kind of high-toned anything for anyone. She knew who she was, and she knew who she was early on. She said that she should have been a boy, that she wanted to grow up to become a farmer, and in essence, everything she did in her life reflected back very early on on what she wanted. Lost Highways is a production of History Colorado and History Colorado Studios. It's made possible by a generous grant from the Sturm Family Foundation, with particular thanks to Stephen Sturm and Emily Sturm. And by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, exploring the human endeavor. Again, if you enjoyed this podcast and want to support it, please become a member of History Colorado. You can get 20% off your membership at historycolorado.org forward slash podcast discount. Plus, you get all kinds of great benefits like free admission to our eight museums around the state where you can learn more about the stories we tell on Lost Highways. And even if you don't become a member, you can still get $2 off admission to any of our museums just by mentioning the podcast. Special thanks to Susan Schulten, our history advisor on this episode, and to Chief Creative Officer Jason Hansen, our editor. And to Amanda Lane of History Colorado, who recently transcribed all our episodes. If you'd like to see the transcripts, either as a matter of accessibility or because you'd like to use Lost Highways in your classroom, you can find them at historycolorado.org forward slash lost dash highways. The music for this episode was by both Earth Control Pill and Neela Pekarik, whose album Rattlesnake is out now and whose folk opera opens in February 2021 in Denver. Our theme is by Connor Bergall. Many thanks to our editorial team, Jason Hansen, Sam Bach, Sean Boyd, Brooke Garcia, Steve Grinstead, Kimberly Cronwall, Jose Ortega, Julie Peterson, Angel V. Hill, Marisa Volpe, and Zach Workowich. And to our advisory group, which includes Stephen Sturm, Emily Sturm, Jason Hansen, Thomas Andrews, Jonathan Futa, Charlie Woolley, Susan Schulten, Tom Romero, and Kara DeGette. Finally, thanks to the entire staff at History Colorado. I'm Noel Black. And I'm Tyler Hill. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.